neither of Welcome to today's, to today's service. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Caroline Horton and I'm the pastoral worker here at St Hilary's. Today we're looking at our second week of Jesus Shaved People, looking at people on the edge and Valerie will talk about that later on. So we begin with our call of, to worship, the responses for the service that will be in bold type on the screen. So we meet in the presence of God, who knows, who knows our, our needs, hears our cries, feels our pain, and heals our, our wounds. Our first song is when we walk with the Lord. The words will be on the screen, and I'm going to hand over to Paul. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord, let's stand together if we're able and uh, we'll sing this lovely song together when we walk with the Lord.
please be seated. I'm going to ask Petra Davis, who's from First Squad, she's going to come and talk to us about what she does and what hopefully will be happening here shortly. So Petra. Good morning. Good morning. I'm setting my stopwatch. <laughs> okay, so you can have the, the first slide. Fabulous. So um, I understand uh, Marie's done a, a short talk on first and first, so I'm just here to explain the overall workings of it. So what is it? It stands for Free Uniform for Schools and it incorporates Free Uniform for Primary Schools, which is the FUPS. And we now include the, uh, the Girl Guiding and the Scout Association. So it all began in um, 2012. Thank you. I'll just give you a nod. 2012 in St. Luke's Methodist Church. It was started by a grandma whose granddaughter was going to a grammar school and she realised how expensive uniforms were. And she asked her church if she could have a little space to store some uniform, began contacting schools and the collections began and so first was born. So having been uh, supported by the Methodist Church, we are now a standalone charity. Uh, we have responded in the last 10 years to 13,000 family requests and given away 55,000 items, which is just amazing. So we have um, we've collected 26 tonnes and saved that, that uniform from going to landfill. Now this equates to 182 tonnes of carbon emissions saved. So the basic calculations are every one tonne of school uniform or clothing that is reused, seven tonnes carbon emissions are saved. So not only is it a, a good charity for the pocket, it's also very good for the planet. Um, at the moment we've got six hubs operating worldwide and we're partnering with 97% of the world schools, which is brilliant. So how does it actually operate? We've got, um, next one, sorry, thank you. Um, so children grow out of their uniforms really quickly as we all know. Um, they, they wear things out, especially boys, they wear their knees out, they lose clothes so, so quickly. Um, so we invite the schools to, um, to partnership with us. Next one again, thank you. Uh, we place a recycled fibre drum in the schools, in the buildings, and we ask the schools to, uh, to send out our flyers, encouraging parents to do also donate and use the service. Um, lost property items are also donated to us at the end of term. Um, caretakers absolutely love us because they can get rid of things out of the, out of the schools before the term begins. Um, when the drum is full, we collect it and take the clothing to the relevant hub. Um, all the hubs, they, uh, they wash, they repair, they sort the uniform into schools and sizes and, um, and, and then hang it or display it. And... Um, Yes. I will distribute any items that aren't relevant to the hub. It's really important that um, any school uniform can be placed into any drum. So you might have um, a family going to St George's who have a, a child in secondary school who goes to Moslems. To us that doesn't matter. It can go into any drum. The, the hub sorts it. I collect it and distribute it as necessary. If the items aren't good enough, if you would not clothe your children in the items that you receive, we then pass them on to further recycling. So next one again, sorry. Um, so nothing is, sent to, nothing is thrown away. The further recycling means that um, the logos are cut out or embroidered names are cut out and destroyed. The items are made into rolls of fabric, it's sent abroad, or it's sent into colleges for, um, for um, technical design. It's, uh, it's a very, very good service. So, what is a hub? So, basically, it's a stock and storage and distribution point, mainly in church halls, wherever there's a little space, but we also have a shop hub as well. So, we will have seven hubs. We've got Hoylake, Morton, Birkenhead, which is the shop one, West Wirral, Lower Bevington, Neston, and now, here at St. Hilary's too. Um, I'm also working really hard to open new ones in Bromborough, Ellesmere Port, and working with the council in Liverpool who have approached us, opening new hubs over there too. Um, some, some hubs, they stock just secondary school uniforms, 
Sunstock does primary and some Birkenhead particularly does both. Some hubs will take online requests via our website. Uh, some are just walking hubs. Is that me? No? Some are walking hubs and some do both. Um, I work with the volunteers because every hub manages itself and every hub is run in a completely different way because people are all individual. So I will work with the core team of volunteers to make sure that they are happy the way that the clients are directed to use them. So I think with St. Hilary's it'll be a walk-in hub. That's absolutely fine. Um, so how do the hubs work? We go on. Um, it begins with a heart to help community. Uh, we're responding to, to God's call to clothe and to feed. Um, we build a core team of volunteers, plus others who can't get out, who can do some washing or repairing or do some DIY if necessary, shelves, cupboard spaces. Um, we need to have a space to sort and to store clothes using rails and hangers and boxes. And the team here have actually been really proactive in sourcing hangers and rails. And um, it's really cheeky, but just go to local businesses and say, this is what we're doing. Can we, uh, can we have some money or can we have some practical help? And the large supermarkets particularly want to help. Um, we collect from local schools um, and then uh, we decide at opening time, often, next one, thank you, often coinciding with a church food activity. I mean, let's face it, that gets people through the door. Each hub, open it, open, each hub organizes their own rotor but if the team is short at any time, then I can come and help as well. So parents and carers come and collect uniforms from you free of charge. They then find that church is a safe place and they want to get involved with other activities that the church run. Um, financial donations that you may receive can be used to support your hub or they can be uh, put into the account, the, the Royal First Bank account. Just one sec read it but okay next one this is our commitment we're all first supporting the hubs St Hilary's will become part of a worldwide organization of 40 plus volunteers you will begin to see how much this project is needed and appreciated by families you'll be thanked you'll have hugs and gratitude you'll be making such a difference to people's lives and spreading God's love in a really practical way every single day. My commitment is that I will support you by promoting your hub on the website, on social media, and talking with local schools. I will provide the paperwork to help you record how many items you give away, how many families you service, and the volume of donations you receive. I will again help by contacting schools and distributing flyers. And I will collect from local schools if necessary, if you want me to. And I'll collect your recycling and irrelevant items. So I hope that you are inspired by the work of Royal Fuss and can see the value of it that would be in your community. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Petra. So there's exciting times ahead as we as a church become a hub for FUS. Please pray for the current hubs in Wirral, the growth of the hubs, and also for the new hub here. Let us quiet in our hearts and minds as we come to our time of confession. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God. Though we have rebelled against him, let us renounce our willingness and ask his mercy by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Please respond with the words in bold type. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save, save us, us and, and help us. us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save, Save us, us and help, help us. For failing you by what we do, think and say. Father, forgive us. 
save, save us, us and help us. us. For let, letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world around us. Father, forgive us. Save, save us, us and help, help us. us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save, save us, us and help, help us. Your mighty and merciful Lord, grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins. Time for amendment of life and the grace and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alan will now lead us in our prayers for others. Let us pray, not thinking just of ourselves and the needs that we're aware of, but thinking of God's world and God's church and those in need. So in these prayers there is a response which I invite you to join in with at the end of each section. When I say, accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, please respond and answer it in your love. And so we come before our merciful God, conscious of the weakness of our faith, but trusting his promise to hear us and answer, saying, accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, and answer them in your love. Merciful God, you know the needs of your church throughout the world, where it is weak, where it is persecuted, where it is poor, where it is rich in faith. We pray for our bishops in this diocese, for Mark and Sam and Julie, and for all leaders of other de denominations and where those in your church work together and partner in the gospel. We pray for this parish. We pray for Jesus-shaped people, for all that we will learn and the ways in which that may change our vision of you and of our mission here. We pray that in the weakness of confusion or disunity, your strength may be shown in the face of apathy and hostility. May your gospel be proclaimed. In the bustle of life, may your peace and love be experienced. Accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, and answer it in your love. Merciful God, you know the needs of this world and its suffering people. We pray today for the victims of natural disaster, for those in the United States, in Pakistan. You know whether these things are man-made or whether they are natural to your fallen world. We also pray for those places of ins uh, political instability or local conflict or those conflicts that affect the whole world. I'm praying especially, again, for Ukraine and Russia, for its leaders, for its people. And so in the pain of despair, may your compassion be revealed and may your love spread abroad. Accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, and answer it in your love. Merciful God, you know the needs of our local community. And so we pray today, especially for the schools and colleges of this area and of this parish. We pray for St George's School, for the Mosslyn School, Weatherhead, Aldershaw, St Mary's College. And we pray for the work of free uniforms for schools, primary and secondary. For that work across the Wirral, 
for the impact that it has in communities and in individual lives and families. We pray especially for those of our community who are struggling or who will struggle financially in this coming winter and this coming year, for those who are less well off and for those who are needy. We pray too for our health centres and places of care, for businesses and homes, for those who are without work and those who are disaffected members of this community. In the joy and the sorrow of the daily round, may your good news shine out through your people. Accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, and answer it in your love. Merciful God, you know the needs of our families and loved ones, and of those in our church family. Let's take a moment to call to mind those who have asked us to pray for them, or for those who are in need, those who are named in our newsletter. We pray especially today for David Bigmore, a member of the URC, well known to many people, uh, who is, uh, uh, was uh, taken ill about 10 days ago and we pray for his recovery and for his wife Margaret. For those we've named in their distress or discomfort, in their grief or anxiety, may the presence of your spirit, the comforter, go beside them and bring them healing and guidance. Accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, and answer it in your love. Merciful God, you know each one of us, and you hear our prayers, even before we put them into words. And so meet us at our point of need, and take us on to where you have called us. Accept the prayer of our hearts, Lord, and answer it in your love, so that your will may be done, and your kingdom come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a collect for the 16th Sunday of Trinity, Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us. Open our eyes to your wonders, that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our life's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jimmy will bring us, read to us our first Bible reading. Our first Bible reading is James chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, and the, past, the reading can be found on page 226 of the New Testament, which is in towards the back of the Church Bibles. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favouritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invo invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfil a royal law according to the scripture. 
You shall love your neighbour as yourself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to hand over to Paul now for two songs. First is I'm going to trust in God. Please stand if you're able.
The second reading is on page four. Oh, please be seated. The second reading is on page 45 in the New Testament towards the back of the Church Bibles. It is Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, help us to listen to your word with understanding, to receive it with faith, and to obey it with courage. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. I want to begin this morning by thinking about our congregation, the community of people who gather here for worship Sunday by Sunday. Take a look around you. Just consider for a moment those things we have in common with one another and those things in which we differ. For example, hands up if you have blue eyes. Something we have in common with some of us, some of our fellow worshippers, but not all. That's just one example. We could think of many more. There may be people here who share a common interest or enjoy the same sport, support the same football team, or who are of a similar age. There are those who are outgoing and who mix easily with others, and those who are more introverted and find small talk difficult. So many things we have in common so many ways in which we differ. But we are all people. Those of you who were here last Sunday and those who've attended one of the small groups during the week will know that we began the Jesus Shaped People programme we've been talking about for so long by focusing on people, identified as one of the five priorities of Jesus in his earthly ministry. Today, and in the small group meetings this week, we continue the people theme, looking this time at people on the edge. People on the edge refers to those things that can cause people to be disadvantaged or excluded in our society today. This might be because of disability, a criminal background, a particular lifestyle, a person's social background or ethnicity. Even if none of those examples apply to us, some of us may well have had experience at some time in our life of being left out or being made to feel of little value. It can happen in childhood. You know that sinking feeling when teams are being chosen in a games lesson and you're the one not being picked. I wonder if that strikes a chord with anyone here. 
So what was Jesus' approach to people on the edge? I'm sure we can all think of examples in the Gospel stories which demonstrate Jesus' concern for the people on the edge in his day. He cared about children. Let the little children come to me and do not stop them, he told the disciples who were trying to prevent people from bringing their children to be touched by him. He healed lepers who were outcasts from society. He gave sight to the blind, healed the sick and cured the lame. He spent time and shared meals with the hated tax collectors, hated because they worked for the Roman occupiers of Palestine, and with people regarded as sinners, those looked down on and shunned by the Jewish authorities. He showed compassion and forgiveness to the woman caught in adultery. Has no one condemned you? he asked her, after all her accusers had slunk away following his challenge to them. No one, sir, she replied. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Jesus not only committed to people on the edge, he also had to deal with those who wanted him to ignore them, who were appalled that he cared about them. Sometimes it was his disciples who couldn't understand his concern for such people. But often it was the religious authorities. The Jesus of Mark's Gospel has been described as a man being watched. The religious authorities watch him, eating, watching especially those he chooses as his company. They watch him walking through the fields. They watch him in the synagogue, as we heard last week. Every inch of the way, he is under observation. One step out of line, the line drawn by those in whom interpretation of the law is vested, and he is immediately attacked. But such attacks never deterred Jesus from his mission to reach out to people on the edge. Bartimaeus, in today's Gospel passage, is a person on the edge. A blind beggar, he would be accustomed to being ignored by anyone passing by, his poverty and marginal status excluding him from society. But this day was different. Just picture the scene. Bartimaeus in his usual spot on the outskirts of Jericho, on the road leading to Jerusalem. Jesus is reaching the climax of his journey to Jerusalem where he will die on the cross. And he leaves Jericho, accompanied by his disciples and a large crowd of people. There was no doubt a great deal of noise and Bartimaeus probably asked what was going on. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts at Jesus. He was told in no uncertain terms to be quiet. The crowd clearly felt that Bartimaeus was no fit person to be expecting Jesus to take any notice of him. But Bartimaeus was having none of it. He clearly recognised Jesus as someone who would listen to him and he cried out even more loudly. And Jesus stood still. Around him is the clamouring crowd. The blind man's cries rise above its noise. No doubt the disciples are loudly volunteering their views on what should be done. None of this touches Jesus' deep stillness. Call him here, he says. And such is his authority that the attitude of the people is changed. Take heart, get up, he's calling you, they tell Bartimaeus. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks Bartimaeus. His focus is upon the need for Bartimaeus to clarify what he's seeking. 
His answer is clear. He wants to see. His answer marks a sharp contrast with the disciples in the previous story in this chapter. When James and John came to Jesus with the request that he do for them what they ask, Jesus had asked them the self-same question he puts to Bartimaeus. What is it you want me to do for you? From James and John, all he got was a request for power, prestige and glory. Bartimaeus, however, knew his need and his dependence on the loving mercy of Jesus. His faith led to healing and Bartimaeus, his sight restored, follows Jesus on the way. In doing so, he leaves behind his cloak, which would have been laid on the ground to collect any money from his begging. A clear act of abandonment to Jesus. Bartimaeus began with need, went on to gratitude and finished with loyalty. A perfect summary of the stages of discipleship. So who are the people on the edge in our community today? Do we need to change our attitude towards them so that they can know that Jesus is calling them? Jesus changed the attitude of the crowd in the Gospel passage so that instead of telling Bartimaeus to be quiet, they encouraged him to go to Jesus. How can we determine to include rather than exclude those people who are disadvantaged in our society, in this parish? Well, we can certainly begin by being a welcoming church. Welcome is one of the claims in our mission statement. And on the whole, St Hilary's is, I think, seen as a church where all comers meet with a welcome. But there's a natural gravitational pull in all of us towards working with people from our own social background and excluding those who are not quite like us for whatever reason. The reading we heard from the letter of James warns against treating people differently because of their social status or appearance and reinforces the commandment, you should love your neighbour as yourself. For us, as a church which welcomes all and loves our neighbour as ourself, this means that our work with people must always be one that is not seeking to do things for people, but to include them in our church life and work. Bartimaeus was not only healed, but also became a disciple. The fact that Mark gives both Bartimaeus' name and his father's name in his Gospel account almost certainly indicates that this family became members of the early church in later time. I don't know how many of you rose to the challenge last week of talking with local people who are not church members and finding out what they think of Jesus and of the local church. I'm certainly not going to ask for a show of hands for those who did. I know the group I was in thought it was a pretty daunting challenge and not one that was easy to undertake. Well, we're not let off the hook this week, I'm afraid. We're urged to try and continue to step out of our comfort zone and make a conscious effort to talk with one person or with a group of people who might feel marginalised in our society. Can we make a determined effort to find out something about their lives, to listen to them and find out what daily life is like for them? Can we help them to express their need, to come to Jesus to find acceptance and purpose in following him? Can we show them that they are valued as people created by God in his image, loved by him and for whom Jesus gave his life in order to give them life in all its fullness. And can we ask ourselves what changes we could make to our church life and services to make people on the edge feel more included? Let us pray.
Lord Jesus Christ, lover of all, you came to this earth to be among us, to heal the broken, to embrace the unloved, and to include the marginalised. Help us to do the same with all whom we meet. Amen. Thank you, Valerie. So there's our challenge this week, to have a conversation with somebody that we, who is on the margins, somebody that we wouldn't usually have a conversation with. So our next song is our Jesus Shaped People song. And so I'm gonna hand over to Paul. Okay. Should we stand together to sing? Where do you sing? Together we say, we believe, we believe in God, God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated as Alan will bring us our notices. Thank you. Yeah, just one, uh, a few announcements to make and bands to read as well. Um, so we've heard about the free school uniforms. Uh, Petra is still here at the end. I hope you can stay for a cup of tea so that people can chat with you and find out uh, more. Um, and um, if you've got any literature or anything like that, then please share it with us. But um, yeah, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we have, in uh, two weeks' time, we have um, our Harvest Sunday. It's our Harvest Thanksgiving, so there'll be a service at the, uh, this usual time. 
um, and uh, it's going to be an all age service so it's uh, uh, all, uh, very, very open to uh, uh, any to come and we uh, hope to have our lunch afterwards a bring and share so bring something to share um, and uh, it will be uh, uh, so it's not bringing your own picnic it's uh, uh, being able to share things uh, with everyone else and so there are a couple of sheets on the large table at the side there where you can say um, not not necessarily exactly what you're going to bring but to say roughly what, what it might be um, whether it's a, a cake or a savory or whatever um, and just uh, so that we know that you are uh, you know we're coming and we'll try and balance things out um, so that's uh, on the 16th and um, our guest speaker on that Sunday will be the Bishop of Stockport who has not been here for worship before so that's um, uh, that'll be really good uh, for us and hopefully for him as well um, uh, so that's in two weeks time the 16th the week after that uh, is our commemoration service and that's not been uh, it's not on the, on the newsletter yet but there will be a list um, of uh, uh, for those who wish to have particular people commemorated uh, and named uh, in that service and uh, uh, re uh, remembered um, so that will be in the afternoon so three o'clock service on the 23rd have I got that right I get dates wrong sometimes but that's the week after okay so yes uh, 23rd uh, for that uh, and yes as Valerie has mentioned and explained the uh, uh, the uh, Jesus shaped uh, people theme continues uh, and there's the, 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 there are leaflets on the table here uh, in front of me just in uh, the other side of the pillar uh, and uh, the groups continue this week if you didn't manage to get to a group last week please find a group to come to um, and uh, uh, please join in as and when you are able. That's an important part of our church life in this, uh, in this period now. I think, that's, I think that's it by way of announcements, unless anyone's going to wave or shout at me. Okay, so I published The Bands of Marriage between Michael Anthony McQueen and Amy Elizabeth Hutchinson. Uh, both are single and both live in this parish and they wish to be married at St Nicholas Church by virtue of their connection with that parish. And so if anyone knows any reason in law why these persons may not marry, you are to declare it. And this is for the first time of asking. So please keep Michael and Amy in your prayers uh, and support them. Uh, Amy's here today along with, uh, along with Mum. Yes, okay, so you're very welcome. Thank you. I think that's it. All right, thank you. Our final song is By Faith We See <coughs> the Hand of God. Please stand if you're able.
compassion in your heart. The joy of God, your strength, strength when times are hard. The presence of God, a peace that overflows. And the word of God, the seed that you will sow. We say together, Heavenly and Father, Father, the scriptures declare that, that your ways are higher than our ways, and your thoughts greater than our thoughts. thoughts. In, In Jesus, Jesus the highway was to be the least and the lowest, and to and reach to all who are lost and broken. Help us to live his life, life today. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, In the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Please stay for refreshments. Thank you.